Now, special coverage from Eyewitness News. The Club Fire Tragedy, 10 years later. Welcome to the special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. We all remember where we were when we learned about Rhode Island's darkest moment. On February 20th, 2003, a fire at the station nightclub in West Warwick claimed 100 innocent lives. Hundreds more were changed forever. Throughout this special, we will be honoring the memories of the victims. We'll also look at how life has dramatically changed in Rhode Island over the last 10 years. Wednesday was the 10-year anniversary of the fire. Family members, survivors, and those just wanting to pay their respects gathered all day to remember. Eyewitness News reporter Sean Daly was at the site. Here's a little from that day. It's just hard to believe that it's been 10 years. Some days it feels like I haven't hugged him in forever, and other days it feels like it was yesterday. So just another day to remember. Today's just a little harder. I don't like coming here. I really don't. <laughs> Tell me why it's important, though, that you came here today, even though you don't like coming here. It's a birthday. I come out on birthdays, you know. Well, I hope she's doing okay, wherever she is. She is. Yeah. She's okay. It's hard. I miss her so much. Yep. It's a hard day. <laughs> Made harder by the fact that it's her birthday? Mm, yeah, it's just hard. Can't celebrate like we used to. Eyewitness News reporter Sean Daly speaking first with Andrea Moda, who lost her uncle Tom Medeiros, and then Patricia Belanger, whose daughter Dina DeMeo also died in the fire. She was a waitress at the nightclub. On Sunday, a memorial service was held to mark the 10-year anniversary and to unveil plans for a permanent memorial at the site. In attendance, former Governor Don Kachiri. Like the night of the fire, Kachiri flew in from Florida to attend this past weekend's event. We had a chance to sit down with him at the Crown Plaza in Warwick, where 10 years ago, family members gathered to get the latest information about the fire and their loved ones. Now, Keep in mind, Kachiri was on the job for just six weeks when tragedy struck. And as you're about to see, he is still overcome with emotion when reliving those dark days. I think we're going there to see a show, you know? And uh, you, know, you don't, uh, nobody ever expected. I mean, somebody lights off a pyrotechnic and turns the place into an inferno. You know, it, it, that's the last. Thing you would ever think. The night of the station fire, former Governor Don Kachiri was in Florida. So I said, well, you got to get me out of here. The next morning, he arrives in West Warwick. So all of our prayers need to go out to the families. It's hard to describe the sight and the feeling as you're standing there looking at uh, what's transpiring. <laughs> Kachiri says he was overwhelmed at how Rhode Island pulled together in its darkest hour. With the enormity of this tragedy, they just, you know, wanted to do anything, anything, you know. Just the outpouring, you know, and then, and then the families that were all here. You had the clergy, you had social service, mental health people. Uh, everybody, uh, community organizations, just trying to do anything they could, if you will, to help. Uh, so. You sort of felt, from my perspective, like the whole state was trying to lift everybody up and respond to this. Clearly, the emotions are still raw 10 years after the fact. Oh, yeah. You still you, feel you, it. You don't. Uh, it, it's, it's something you never get over. And I always think about the families. As, as bad as I feel and as, uh, you know, as emotional as I can get talking about or thinking back, think about the families. Three nights after the fire, Kachiri says he and his wife Sue learned the identity of one of the victims, Catherine O'Donnell. I looked and said, my God, so I, I worked with her father uh, years ago, and when our kids were young, we used to camp together. We were <laughs> good friends when our kids were young, and we both sat there and just tears. That really speaks to Rhode Island, doesn't it? We were all in some way touched by this fire. Oh, yeah, everybody. 
if you didn't have a loved one, you knew somebody that did, you know, and uh, so yeah. What could you possibly say to the O'Donnell family at that time? <clears throat> anything was no. You can't. You can't say anything, Tim. I learned that too. All you can do is sort of hug them, uh, and uh, you know, try and share. You understand the pain. Uh, we gave a lot of hugs. <laughs> Governor Kichiri called Rhode Island's response to the fire the state's finest hour. Eyewitness News anchor Mike Montecalvo had a chance to speak with the chaplain for the Warwick Police and Fire Departments. Father Robert Marciano was one of the first responders to the scene. Ten years later, he still marvels at the bravery he saw that night. It was just ordinary working class people. A night of fun turned tragic on February 20th, 2003. It was just, you know, a nightmare beyond description. When a fire at the station nightclub killed 100 people and injured more than 200 others. Just complete shock at what was happening. I didn't, I couldn't comprehend to try to take it all in and to try to get these people help. Father Robert Marciano, pastor of St. Kevin's Church, is also chaplain to the Warwick Police and Fire Departments. He was one of the first responders to the scene. I cannot describe the heroics. I mean, the place was an inferno and they were rushing into it. I mean, the, the building was collapsing and they were inside trying to drag these people out. The fire left many first responders scarred for life. We had some fatalities um, in the, in, as far as emotional fatalities from this, firefighters and police officers that just couldn't get back on track after witnessing what they did and we understood that. Driving by was almost impossible. I don't think I drove by the scene for years. Um, if I had to go somewhere in Coventry, West Warwick, I would go around. Some of the families wanted to know where was God on this tragic night? That question happens when bad things happen to good people, you know, and the answer I always give is that um, he was right there suffering alongside these, uh, these poor victims. And for the firefighters and police officers who put their lives on the line. Afterwards, at all our briefings, I said, you just earned your whole pay for your whole career tonight because of what they witnessed and the brave acts that they, they performed and what they will carry with them all their lives. It's Father Marciano's prayer that families will be able to finally heal, knowing their loved ones are in a better place. We have hope that uh, certainly God is with us. And for those of us who are Christian, that death is not the end. It was very consoling to families. I kept saying to some of the parents, your son or daughter will always be young. That was Eyewitness News anchor Mike Montecalvo reporting. On Wednesday, Father Marciano returned to the site for the first time in 10 years. The band Great White was performing the night of the fire. Their guitarist is among the 100 victims who died. The family Ty Longley left behind includes a son who was not born yet. Eyewitness News reporter Walt Buteau has more on this little boy's love for a father he never met. Ty Longley was said to be very excited about the birth of his first child. And with the mother's permission, we talked to the nine-year-old about his very grown-up way to honor the father he never met. With his mother aiming the camera, A.C. Longley jumps into one of his favorite childhood activities. But his mom tells us her little boy is far more mature than her. It is true. True story. <laughs> Heidi Longley held the phone while her nine-year-old Skyped with us from Illinois about a decade after that night. Ty for over two years. She was three months pregnant when she flew to Rhode Island looking for Ty, hoping he was alive. As a single mother, she made sure her son heard plenty of stories about his rock star father. How he really wanted to see me and how he really did love me and how he named me. Ty's son is already playing the drums and decided last year he wanted to do something else to honor his father. So at eight, he organized a charity to collect toys for hospitalized children. Yes, I do it to help the kids in the hospital and to do this in memory of my father. His charity is called Beats, as in bringing everyone a tremendous smile. The father he never met knows all about it, according to AC's mother, who tells him this. Your father's 
is, is pretty proud of you and he's looking down on you saying oh wow well, like my son is doing this charity so people could remember me and I'm not forgotten. AC Longley is collecting drumsticks, Legos, and iTunes cards. You can find out more by going to our website, WPRI.com. In West Warwick, Walt Buteau, Eyewitness News. Former State Police Colonel Brendan Doherty wasn't supposed to be in charge the night of the fire, but his boss, Colonel Stephen Perry, was away, meaning Doherty, who was second in command, took charge that night. On February 20th, 2003, then Lieutenant Colonel of the State Police, Brendan Doherty, got a call just before midnight. He told me there was a bad fire and uh, there's several people uh, dead. At 2 a.m., the phone rings again. It was catastrophic. I've seen so many uh, tragedies throughout my career, my 28 years in the State Police, but this is one that uh, I'll, I'll never forget. Doherty became a point person in West Warwick for those looking for a loved one. I mean, young children coming to the scene, wanting to know if their mother or father was there. It was just horrific. The Crown Plaza was ground zero for families. This is where they came looking for answers. When it really hit me was when a mother grabbed me and she wouldn't let go of me and she was showing me a picture of her daughter, asking me if I've seen her daughter. Answers were few in the hours, even days following the fire. The identification process took a while, but Doherty recalls there was a sense of relief, even from those who lost loved ones, when they finally learned what happened. Days after the fire, Doherty was asked to address family members. They were so appreciative that I ended up not being able to speak right away because they were clapping so loud. It must have been emotional. It was emotional because I just saw that as, at least they know that I'm doing the best I can and uh, really wasn't able to talk for a minute. Um, I just can't tell you how painful it was to see what these families were going through. Now, Doherty tells me they faced serious challenges in the days after the fire because the site was considered a crime scene. Doherty needed to manage that and let family members come in to pay their respects. So they erected a fence, a now iconic, iconic image where people put flowers and other tokens of their love. The leader of the band, Great White, spoke exclusively with Eyewitness News. And the father of the youngest victim tells us of the chance meeting between his son and Jack Russell the day before the concert. Once again, Eyewitness News reporter Walt Buteau. The day after the fire. And then I'm not throwing water on him. Was the last time Jack Russell spoke publicly to us about what happened that night. And then before you knew it, the lights went out and it was all over. Russell's career continues, although there's an ongoing legal fight over the right to use the name Great White. Hey, Jack, it's the lead walk. singer talked with Target 12 from California. Sometimes it seems really far away, and then there's other days where, you know, I can almost smell it. And I'm not trying to sound like old oh, poor me, because, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones. 18-year-old Nikki O'Neill was in the front row when the fire started. And O'Neill's band was scheduled to open for Great White the next night. We have only questions. Nikki's father tells us the day before the fire, as his son bought tickets to the concert, he was greeted by a man with long, curly blonde hair. And Nikki then realized he was, it was Jack Russell. And he hit it off famously with him, and, and Jack was very nice to him. Russell says he knew at least 20 people at the show, and his lead guitarist, Ty Longley, and two friends who traveled from California to see the concert were among the 100 victims who died. I can't imagine how it feels like, you know, for a mother to lose her son or, or a, a husband to lose his wife. Russell tells Target 12 the pyrotechnics that are blamed for starting the fire were planned for just the opening song. It was a really small part of the show. I wish to God, I, I, you know, we never would have even thought of it. Plenty of nights when we, were, when we were on that tour that we were told no, we said, okay, fine. Russell adds he does not blame anyone for blaming him. Kane says his frustration with Russell is that he was never charged while Great White's tour manager was. How come he walks when this guy Beakley, Dan Beakley, who was just working for Russell, has to go to prison like this. 
It was ridiculous. It was wrong and it was unfair. There was no malicious intent on anybody's part. You know, it was just a horrible, horrible accident. Russell played a concert earlier this month in California and offered the proceeds to the Station Fire Memorial Foundation, but the offer was rejected. You know, the frustrating thing is, is there's nothing that I can ever say that will ever make anybody feel any better. What do you say when somebody's lost a loved one? Nothing, you know, you know, I can't bring anybody back. That was Eyewitness News reporter Walt Buteau. Russell tells us he sent the money from his February concert to that charity started by the son of the late Ty Longley. Former club owners Jeffrey and Michael Dedarian did not respond to our request for an interview, and the attorney for great white band manager Dan Beakley said his client was not available. Beakley is now living in Florida. All three pleaded no contest to 100 counts of manslaughter after a controversial plea deal was struck. We sat down for a moving interview with a survivor. She tells us she's still coping with painful memories. Eyewitness News reporter Steve Nielsen has this report. It's a place filled with a lot of memories for Linda Fisher. People ask me all the time, are you mad, are you angry, is there anyone you hate or blame? That's not a productive way to live life. You know, you can't be mad all the time. That's counterproductive to surviving. Fisher was severely burned when she got out through a window that night 10 years ago. After being in a coma for weeks and going through multiple surgeries, she still deals with a lot of problems. Couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we kept saying it'll get better, it'll be easier and all this stuff. And it was hard to picture that. Things did get better, though. She went to the memorial at the site for the first time since the fire. Ten years later, though, she still deals with a lot of issues because of her injuries. Simple things like braiding her hair are near impossible. We get all these comments of, oh, you all need to just get over it. It's like, well, maybe move on, yes. Get over it? Not so easy to do when every single day there's something that you've encountered that is a reminder of this is what happened. She said it was hard on the survivors to watch that nightclub fire in Brazil because of all the similarities and the work the survivors did to make sure that would never happen again. The fire in Brazil was like a punch in the face, like no one heard what we had said all this time. So it, it really hurt. Now going forward, Fisher has a two-year-old granddaughter. Looking forward to playing in the yard with her. Someone she's thankful to have. That was Eyewitness News reporter Steve Nielsen. Families will soon have a permanent place to remember their loved ones. Plans for a memorial park were unveiled this past weekend. It will feature an open-air pavilion, pathways winding through a dozen memorial gardens, and individual monuments for each of the victims. The Station Fire Memorial Foundation is planning to hold a comedy show on March 8th to raise funds for the park. Construction is slated to begin in the spring, but for years, a family member of one of the victims has taken care of the current site. Eyewitness News reporter Susan Campbell has that story. For 10 years, 100 crosses have marked the site of the deadly station nightclub fire. And for 10 years, the same person has lovingly and painstakingly cared for this property. It's a special person that can do something like that. It, it means a lot. It needs the care. It really does. It, it, it's been kept as well as it can be kept. We've learned the volunteer caretaker is a man who lost his brother in the fire. He's a private person and doesn't want recognition for his work. But over the past decade, his efforts haven't gone unnoticed. He does hours taking care of that land. He does days making sure that it's just right. I, I believe that he is saying to his brother, I got you covered. And though these crosses have served as a memorial for 10 years, construction on a permanent memorial park is scheduled to begin this spring to honor the memory of the fire's 100 victims. Their souls are here, and I think they're happy. That was Susan Campbell reporting. Rhode Island changed dramatically in the wake of the station fire. Within days, the state's fire code was being scrutinized. Lawmakers immediately began rewriting legislation, and Governor Don Kachiri signed it into law months after the fire. Eyewitness News anchor Susan Roberts brings us a look at fire regulations today. The first responders were just some of the heroes on February 20, 2003. 
One of those Warwick firefighters rushing in was Peter Janite. The way that that fire accelerated, uh, the speed by which it moved through the station was something I hadn't seen in my 20 years as a firefighter. To this day, he remembers every victim he came in contact with. And as a former state lawmaker, he has worked on their behalf over the last 10 years fighting for tougher fire codes. The state has made remarkable improvements. Here's what those stricter fire codes mean. Rhode Island nightclubs with a capacity over 150 people must have sprinkler systems. Curtains, bar stools, paint, carpeting have to be fire resistant. Clubs are subject to more frequent surprise inspections. Staffers must be trained in crowd management. And the grandfather clause exempting older establishments from the updated code was thrown out. When we're dealing with human lives, dealing with these types of venues, there should be no exemption. The new laws have gained international attention. Still, we asked Janite, could the state be any safer? I feel we are the safest state in the country from my perspective. These codes can't change what happened, but Janite hopes they will prevent another tragedy. In the years following the new laws, businesses and nonprofits began to feel the pinch from the stricter codes. Installing expensive sprinkler systems, for example, was too much for some to afford. I asked former Governor Kachiri if he thinks the fire code went too far. I, I think at the time th there was just so much anguish uh, and desire uh, to avoid this happening that it's natural, I think, that you over, overreact. And, and uh, I supported it. I signed the legislation. Uh, but I think that uh, over time there have been efforts to try and, and modify that a bit, and I've been supportive of those too. The station fire has prompted clubs nationwide to take a hard look at how they handle emergencies. Eyewitness News reporter Susan Hogan shows us how bouncers are being trained to sense panic and react. We need to address their safety. Inside this nightclub in Providence on any given night, you could have a crowd in the hundreds. A group in the grips of panic will not act with collective interest. But on this Saturday afternoon, the Coliseum's lights are up, music off, and the tone solemn. I don't think it's any coincidence that we find 67 fatalities located right at the exit. Trainer Fraser Olgren is teaching these bouncers an invaluable lesson about sensing panic and more importantly, how to get people out safely, especially in a situation where every second counts. When we look at the lessons learned, a staff's ability to manage a crowd that is presented with something challenging like a fire becomes a life and death answer. Providence nightclub owners say it's critical to train their bouncers because in an emergency there is absolutely no room for mistakes ever. We have to teach them remember when an emergency happens all bets are off every exit is open everyone is brought towards there and the only way you can do this is by having your staff trained. Robert. After the four hour training course is over bouncers are handed certificates and hopefully handed an invaluable lesson in survival. I knew quite a few people uh, that were in the station fire, um, so it, uh, I, t I think it's serious. I, I take the safety serious. As of right now, Providence is the only city in Rhode Island that requires bouncers to be licensed. As we continue our special edition of Newsmakers Club Fire Tragedy 10 years later, we want to take a moment to bring you a tribute to the victims who lost their lives one decade ago.
those we lost in the station nightclub tragedy. Our sincere thanks to everyone who shared their stories with us. We want to leave you now with scenes from the site on Cowesett Avenue in West Warwick. A moment to reflect on the lives lost and the survivors who continue to inspire us all. I'm Tim White. For everyone here at Eyewitness News, thank you for watching.